an encore. <laughs> All right, in our, uh, in our final talk of the day, we're going to hear a great story of how one person uh, came back to his hometown of Detroit to solve some of the most challenging data problems the city has faced. Uh, please welcome Garland Gilchrist. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Socratic Customer Summit. I think I'm the last person to talk, or the second to last person to talk, which means that I have an unenviable position. I am attempting to tell you something that I think is important, that I think matters. But I'm standing between you and the end of two very long days. But I promise you I'm going to try to make it worth your time. I am from the city of Detroit. I was born in what I believe to be the greatest city in the world. Oh, I love that. Yes. Yes. That is my favorite person in the room right now. Our great city is at a very unique moment in its history. We recently celebrated our 313th anniversary, our area codes 313, so that was really a cute coincidence that it was when I was there. We're in a unique moment in our history. A moment where city government is literally in an unprecedented position. Many of you may have read the headlines, may have seen the stories, some of which are thoughtful, some of which are not so thoughtful, some of which are insightful and ask hard questions, some of which only search for surface level, anecdotal, not helpful things to say. But it's true that we are a city that is both, that it juxtaposes challenge and opportunity in a way that I don't think any other city in the world faces. Before I get into that, let me back up and tell you why I'm in Detroit right now. So I was born in Detroit, spent half, my first half of my childhood in Detroit, west side of Detroit, east side of Detroit. Spent the second half of my childhood in Detroit's outer, or inner ring suburbs, a city called Farmington. My parents, they were born and raised in the city of Detroit. They loved their city, and it broke their heart they agonized over a decision to think about why they wanted to move their family away from the city that they loved, the place that they had built their entire lives, because they wanted a future that they thought made sense for their kid, their only child. That was about challenges with safety, public safety, challenges with our education system, and uncertainty about the future. So they did what a lot of parents do. They do what they think is in the best interest of their children's future. And they made this decision to move. I didn't understand it as an eight-year-old, but that decision would have a monumental impact on how I viewed the world, how I viewed my city, how I viewed public service, how I viewed technology. And I'll tell you how that, th that thread weaves through. So my first job was working to build computers, like literally build computers, like take memory cards and put them on motherboards and then take SCSI cables and connect them from motherboards to hard drives in towers in 98. I was part of this, this crazy uh, revolution called Y2K compliance, which all of you know as technical people like didn't really mean that much. <laughs> that was my first job and the first five computers I built they were installed at a community center on the west side of Detroit called Weigel. Unfortunately, it's now closed. And with those five computers, I got a chance to you know, put them in the community center, set up the little tables, plug them in, put the monitors there. I got a chance to teach a class that showed the people who patronized that community center how to use these computer things to do stuff. Showed a little girl the internet for the first time, Internet Explorer showed a woman returning to the workforce after uh, raising her children how to write a resume using Microsoft Word. Showed a senior citizen, a woman who was 67 years old, how to use the mouse, because she already knew how to play solitaire, but she could play it on the computer. Why does all this matter? Why does this matter to me, my story in Detroit? That experience burned into me the importance of how technology 
and access to technology, access to skills, access to experiences, can transform individuals, both their lives and their perceptions of what's possible in the world. It's my belief that in the city of Detroit, more equitable, more complete, more inclusive, higher quality, higher speed access to more information about every aspect of life in Detroit can help transform both Detroiters' understanding, experiences, and perceptions of what our city's future can be, as well as give others the opportunity to truly understand what's happening in our city and analyze it and participate in it fairly, participate in it in a way that can actually have them be helpful. I see technology as a very empowering thing. Data as a very empowering thing. Breaking down barriers to information access, reducing or eliminating information asymmetry, the inequitable balance of information in any given relationship. That's one of the ways we can deal with some of the challenges and inequities that so many cities face, that so many municipalities face, that so many places face. If we could deal with that information challenge, we can have better conversations about what's happening. So back to my story. So I'm 14. I called it my first job, but it wasn't a job because my mother got it. So my mom worked at General Motors, right? And the guy that fixed her computers, he had this computer building business on the side. So she convinced him he liked him. He was a young black guy. She thought he was attractive. Hey, my son likes to be, would like to be like you. He was kind of tall, used to play basketball. I used to play basketball, not surprising. And he said, yeah, I, I, he can work with me, but I, I can't pay him. And my mother, of course, caring about my financial well-being and my job prospects, says she didn't care if he didn't pay me. She just wanted me to go work for him. That experience greatly impacted how I looked at the world, even if I didn't understand it yet. After high school, I went to the University of Michigan, studied in computer engineering and computer science. Michigan's a really good school. I agree. Um, <laughs> and left to be a software developer at Microsoft in Seattle, which in case you, um, for those of you who may be geographically challenged, is not in Detroit. <laughs> takes three days to drive to Seattle from Detroit. I've done it four times. I understand exactly how long that takes. I wanted to write software. I thought I was gonna do cool stuff. I was gonna change the world. I was gonna work on things that so many people would touch that would matter. Went and worked on a product called SharePoint, fastest growing business unit in Microsoft's history to that point. Went from zero dollars to a billion dollars in less than nine months. I was a performance engineer helping big companies understand how to deploy SharePoint, how to structure their information in a SharePoint instance so that they could do their jobs better and share information more effectively within their organizations. So when I was like 21 or 22, like that sounded awesome. But if you, if you, now if you think about it, that actually didn't sound anything like using technology and information and data and access to skills to like improve the lives of people at a community center in Detroit. I'm a relatively smart guy, but it took me three years to realize that Microsoft wasn't the best place for me to do that. Three years. It was in that time when I finally started thinking about, why did I get into technology? Why do I care about data? Why do I read stuff? Why do I write a blog on the internet? Why do I ask questions that I believe are rigorous to understand how things actually work, how information actually flows through a community or through a process? Why do I do that? I do it because I believe that information and access to it can truly be transformative. So I quit Microsoft, I left Seattle, a lot of scratching people in Seattle. Seattle's a nice place. My wife didn't like Seattle so much, so it was okay. So I left Seattle to move here to Washington, D.C. And the idea of coming to D.C. was trying to get a little closer to that notion of how can technology change people's lives. I worked for an organization called the Center for Community Change, where we were a community organizing outfit that strived to help people design basically their own agendas for public policy in, the neighbor, in their neighborhoods and in their cities. Well, through that process, what I came to the realization of is that 
You know what's a lot more effective if you have good information, if you do the research, if you do the analysis? Advocacy. It's a lot easier to engage with a public official, a legislative body, a regulatory organization, if you actually understand not only their outputs in terms of policy and in terms of data, but if you actually understand how their processes work, if you can see into how those organizations function from an information management perspective. So what's great about the opportunity that open data, that transparency from these sorts of bodies presents, is it actually for real increases account accountability in a way that organizers, in a way that other policymakers, in a way that us folks that work for the government, we can push ourselves to be more open and therefore get more eyes and more ideas into our decision-making process. It took time to understand that our organizing needed to be more rigorous at the Center for Community Change. It took time for us to understand that we needed to not only challenge ourselves as far as our political ideas, but also how we managed our information, how we pushed for the people that we wanted to hold accountable to be better sharers and communicators of their information and their process. So I stayed here in DC for five years. I worked on problems like that and similar ones until I was presented with the greatest professional challenge in my life, which was in my city, the place that I left nine years prior and wanted to come back home to really bad, truly did, had to do some work on my wife to want to come home. I wanted to come home to apply some things that I'd learned around the country in my experiences professionally and personally to deal with this fundamental and foundational inequity of access to information in my city of Detroit. Because I felt that that was the lane that I could drive in to really have an impact. I'm not a real estate developer or a real estate mogul. I ain't got enough money for that. You know, I've, I haven't actually been an elected official. I'm not an educator. But I do kind of understand information systems. I do kind of understand software. I do kind of understand what technology can enable if used appropriately, if pointed in the right direction at the right problem at the right time. And in my estimation, the estimation of our mayor of Detroit, Mike Duggan, the estimation of our chief information officer, Beth Niblock, the right time was now, or was last year. The right problem was addressing one of the foundational inequities in our, in our city which is access to information and high quality information. And the right angle was starting from a place of changing how people and organizations could access information. I don't need to educate this room on what an open data policy is and what transparency actually means and looks like, I don't think. But Detroit, like many other cities, was a place where the way you got information was to know somebody. And that was kind of it. That relationship base, that social network way of getting at information is one of the most frustrating things for Detroiters who felt like the city's future was being defined without them. Who felt like there were things happening, there were, there were purchases being made, there were deals being handshook that they didn't even know were happening or could find out about on the back end but didn't understand why that was all because certain people have better access to other people who have better information and can find it more quickly. So the whole motivation of creating an open data policy in the city of Detroit, it was only actually a little bit about like putting building permits on the internet. It was only a little bit about letting people know that they could, a neighborhood group know that they could do their own analysis of reported crime activity in their, in their turf. It was only a little bit about seeing how parks were maintained. It was really about answering the question, 
what can the city government do? The city government that's supposed to serve the entirety of our city of Detroit, our residents and our businesses. What can we do to make equal everyone's access to information? How can we put it out on the same platform at the same time? So there's no way to like get on a special text message list to get an alert before everyone else gets it. What can we do to make it fair? Because that's our job, is to empower everyone to have an opportunity to not only thrive, but to succeed in a way that they can never imagine. But here's the other thing that's challenging in our city. Besides just opening up information, we also had to try to be creative about how do we distribute it? I was in a meeting this morning with the chairman of the FCC, Tom Wheeler, and Commissioner Mignon Clyburn uh, in Detroit, where they were facilitating a roundtable discussion on broadband inclusion in our city. We have a very, very deep challenge with equitable access to high-speed internet in our city. So what that means is, although we can work to put information on the internet, we have to think a little bit harder about for our brothers and sisters who may not yet be on the internet or may only be on the internet for a certain part of the month until their data plan runs out. How do we make sure that they can still have access to the information so that they are not left out of the insights and analyses and ultimately the uh, creative problem solving that needs to happen to deal with what we're dealing with in Detroit? So we're trying to pilot a few things in that regard. One, going back to these community centers, I really like community centers. People patronize community centers and they talk to the staff people, right? Hey, how you doing? What's your programs happening? You know, my daughter likes volleyball. Do you guys have like a, a, a league or, or, or a camp or something that she can go to? But they also get to talking about all kinds of other things, what they're frustrated about. Did you see that thing happening? There's a new gas station on this corner. Oh man, I heard that someone got robbed. We're working to try to train our frontline staff people in city government who work at these types of community centers to be personal open data portals for the people that they interact with. What does that entail? That entails actually making sure that our city staff on the front line, you know, they, they for real know what the asset is, know what's there, know how to navigate it, know how to use the technology, but more importantly, than they know how to have a conversation with the person when they get asked a question, they can say, oh, you have a question about park maintenance. You have a question about street lights. I think we have something on our open data portal for that. Let me pull that up on my cell phone and have a conversation with you to answer that question. That does a few things. First, it enables, it, it, it evolves the conversation to being not only personal, but also informative and potentially leads to inspiring action ideas for our citizens to say, you know what, now that I know this information, I can take this back to my family or to people on my block or to other members of my neighborhood and do something with that information that I may not have had access to before. It means that our neighborhood organizations, which are some of the strongest I've ever had the honor of working with, they can really now step up to the plate and challenge city government to make sure that we're doing the right things. We have a really interesting example where um, there was perceived to be an uptick in, in uh, smashing grabs in cars in a certain part of our city. And so our city, you know, we responded saying, yeah, you know, this, this, this seems like there's an uptick here. We're gonna, we have this idea for how we're gonna um, deal with this problem in this particular neighborhood. This was after we had released our open data portal. And citizens of Detroit self-organized around our open data portal to say, hey, so here's the thing. It's not actually really an uptick in just this part of the city. It actually doesn't really increase activity in this part of the city. So we deserve a solution that's citywide because here's what the data says about this particular type of incident. Those weren't data scientists that made that analysis. Those weren't university researchers. 
Those are people that lived in Detroit. That's a much higher quality conversation than yelling and screaming at someone because you heard that the police didn't respond. Or you heard that something didn't happen, that someone didn't show up when, the, when, the, when there was a call. That higher quality conversation, the type of conversation that actually puts citizens on the same pedestal as government as far as access to information because we're giving them everything that we have, that fundamentally changes the dynamic of that relationship in a way that is super, super empowering to our citizens that can help them own their future. So to close, I believe that putting more information, putting higher quality information into our citizens' hands in Detroit will change our future for the better. And for all of you considering doing that in your cities or in your businesses, I encourage you to do the same because you will be blown away by what people will do when they have that same access to your data. Thank you. Mm -hmm.